Welcome to another episode of CMAS, Christian, Christian Masculinism. Today we have a big panel, I think the largest panel this channel has ever had by Jove. And of course, you all recognize Peugeot of Retrogrades, the four panelists, myself and Will Noland, Elliot Hulse, Michael Robillard. And we're joined today by two special guests, AJ Barker and Royce White, who are piping in from Minnesota. Royce has been everywhere in the news, and we appreciate you two stopping by. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. always a pleasure. It's an honor. Thanks for coming by, Royce. You're a uh, you've been all over the news lately. Catch him, folks, on Whitlock or really anywhere else where commentary is popping. Age and of course, Royce uh, played in the NBA. Has been an outspoken spokesman on anxiety and professional sports. I have here your book. I think AJ, uh, you worked with Royce on this MMA by MBA. This is a good, good critique of modern sport in America. Good stuff. And uh, Royce, these days you have been everywhere. Your name speaks for itself. AJ, you played football at Minnesota. You're a good dude. We talked a lot about uh, sport and men and women on a show you did on this particular channel with me. I'm yeah, just really glad. You get, yeah, no, great, great to have all you guys here today. We're talking about Christian masculinism, and it's an honor to have uh, six Catholic dudes that <laughs> can get together, discuss this. None of us are in uh, tweed and blues. Or whatever. None of us are LARPing. Not, no one said, "Hey, do we all need to have a prop like a cigar?" We're we're just going to be uh, yeah. shooting the breeze for an hour or so about a few prompted topics that I think I think people need to hear about. So, yeah, we'll we'll try a panel of six. I'm excited. I'm excited for this today. We're talking about everything we talk about on these Sea Mask shows are what's uniquely masculine, and today we're talking about. The uniquely masculine intellectual tradition that is Western philosophy, and I, we're not going to be talking in great depths, metaphysics or anything like that, but what I woke up thinking this morning, uh, Mike, Mike, I'll ask you this first, and then we can just go around the, the circuit here, is um, the naturally exclusive nature of philosophy. Which is, which is good because in all other domains, we're having to fight to keep men and women separate. And um, that's, that's something that's worthwhile. Um, what do you say, Mike? I think, uh, yeah, I think it's just a, it's a feature of how men are purpose-built. And uh, we have an affinity towards logos and towards reason. Uh, and we're, we're inclined that way. And I don't think it, if we look at the history of the Western tradition, we look at contemporary logic, math, mathematics, chess, uh, engineering, computer science, all these areas that are underpinned by uh, logic and logos. You find, unsurprisingly, a, a predominant amount of men. And uh, it's always been that way. And I don't think that that's any, any surprise. Uh, and you can look at contemporary statistics and, you know, uh, uh, contemporary st statistics and our intellectual heritage and it shows itself over and over again so I think that's a a demonstration of how men are purpose built exactly exactly well, let's just go around the wheel we'll, we'll try this for starters this highly experimental six person deal um Royce, you and AJ can so just just pick up after the last guy talks, and we'll see how how this works. Is it on us? Yeah. Oh no, no. So sorry, this would be. So I'm I'm thinking you're looking at the screen, Elliot. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm wondering what the order is here because I see. Uh, yeah. Our our oh, order is Tim, then us, then it goes. Uh, we got a little T shape here on our end. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, we have a T shape. All right. So El Elliot on my screen. You're next. In my book, you're next, Elliot. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, men tend to be objective, women subjective. Women have sort of a, an interest in themselves a lot more so than men, where men are more interested in what to do, what is the right thing to do 
how to live life, what is objective truth as opposed to, you know, for women, it's self-preservation. You know, they're turned inward, which is normal and natural because that's where life is given from a woman, right? Inside. Life grows on the inside of her. So for her to be considering what is of value or what is of truth on the outside is against her nature and normal and natural. And it's good for her to be, what it, what's the word, solipsistic of sorts yeah, and, yeah. and allow this space for men or, you know, kind of get out of the way or just have a total disinterest in what is good for many what is good for all what is transcendent what is objective that's beautiful that 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 and elliot that's an excellent expression of the birth of like athenian philosophy is just looking up at the stars looking at change occurring in material objects and being like and, and it was men and this isn't something we should shrink from uh, admitting this this is a, a manly thing it's this there's nothing wrong with the fact that women uh don't do that or they began trying to do it recently but they yeah, never yeah. did that but we see yeah. the perversion on in the inversion where men are now very inward focused what's my life all about what am i supposed to do what do i feel and so the the opposite i guess of philosophy would be this sort of sense of silly silly <laughs> yeah. right say the word right but it's an inward turning. It's a it's a focus on self rather than you know what men of old had done, which is look up, like you say. Yeah, yeah. Women and solipsism, uh, and men, modern men, and and uh, male solipsism. What what do you say, Will? I think that's excellent. Yeah, I'd agree with that, and I think that we don't want to draw too hard a line between men and women because the cardinal virtues are the same. There aren't a different set for men than there are for women. So we're still with prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude. It's just these come out differently in men compared to women. So taking the most important one, prudence, the man sits at the interface between the family and the public sphere. So he's going to have a more abstract interest in the principles, in the knowledge he needs to live well and to direct his family. Whereas like Elliot was saying with the woman, it's very much more focused on what goes inside the household walls. So I think men have more of a concern with what's outside the household while still keeping one foot in it. The balance is different. Yeah, note that uh, prudence is the only thing even beginning to concern the intellect in those cardinal virtues, the, the, the rest, temperance justice fortitude these aren't well actually justice in particular justice is one of uh it, actually technically a, a a moral virtue but prudence is the only intellectual virtue in the four and it's not the same thing as speculative knowledge so that that's specifically what we're asking about here a, a good man is prudent is supremely prudent in now, and we're not talking about LARPy ways, in non-LARPy ways. A good man knows when to restrain himself. I want to talk a lot about restraint today, which also involves temperance. A good woman knows when to restrain herself uh, and, and when to speak out. It's uh, almost like an instinct thing. A really good man, a really good woman, they they cultivate these things through habit. But but it's it's part, it partly seems to be an inborn instinct or something that's cultivated. I know that doesn't make me sound very Aristotelian, but we're talking today about uh, speculative, speculative knowledge, like Elliot said, uh, well, literally being focused outward on the world. And we're going to talk about politics uh, in, in a second, which is not speculative, but it still involves an outward kind of interaction with the world based on observation. And that is, uh, you're right, we don't want to draw too uh, hard a distinction between men and women along the lines of the cardinal virtues. I make that exact point you just made in chapter five of the case for patriarchy here. It's like, look, they just come out in different ways. But speculative knowledge is different from prudence. It's not something that that women are born with the strong drive for. Yeah. So can I can I pick up from here? You bet, AJ. I I think I'm gonna draw us into deep waters for a second and at least just square out the bases in my own head. Um 
and and so start by saying like we as humans have a rational intellect so that means our intellect's mediated by our senses right it passes through our body so the way that that passes through the senses to our faculties is going to be different in one person from another person and sort of categorically from men to women and right the the ability to use the intellect to abstract that knowledge from it is going to pertain to how one handles their faculties especially the faculties of memory imagination right passions how the passions affect one person versus another and so this is kind of to piggyback on what will was saying i think you see something where uh maybe elliot was pointing at this too but where where the women maybe have a tendency toward the temporal and the immediate whereas the man not having that same uh biological substrate right uh, roughly speaking not not that we're fundamentally sort of different in our biological substrate, but having those different component pieces, we're going to have this maybe sense to, in a way, almost rush carelessly into the fully speculative, into the eternal. Um, I say carelessly because the, the tendency is going to push us there. It doesn't mean we're going to handle it well. Um, but I think when you're pushed towards something into a space in that way, you're more likely to sort of get oriented to it from there. Right. So you're more likely to pick it up with time as sort of uh, finesse and expertise in that area. And I, I think that if we if we start from that place, you start to see where, you know, maybe I'm speaking for myself here, but but if a if a woman's really strong in the intellect in that that capacity for abstraction. OK, cool. Good. Great. You know, um, but let's not you know throw a fit if, like you said, a uh, hundred of the top hundred chess players are men or if some field is dominated by men just like i think rafael nadal pointed this out the other week he goes he goes you know i don't know why you have this distinction between men and women but i just know that it's there and i know that there's things that women are stronger in that they're just they're always going to make more money i think he's talking about money in sports they're always going to make more money in modeling than men will it's just going to be the case um and so i think i think if we work out kind of from there and engage that reality um then we can more maturely uh, uh proceed from there so well what to what to say after uh five hitters go at a at a topic like this um you know i, I think the need to answer this question about masculine let, let, let me talk about it from a cultural and sociological standpoint i think the the impulse to need to answer these questions about masculinity and femininity stem from the obvious crisis of of femininity that that comes from a a failure of masculinity and um you know it it, it strikes me as <clears throat> um more important that men clarify their own will and their own their own role in the dynamic between god man woman and child um than to need to sort of distinct dis distinguish ourselves or justify uh why we're different than women so much i mean you know and and yeah. I, I think yeah. that this is is the case in large part that there is an intentional and targeted sort of beta male project that has been waged by Satan from, you know, since time immemorial. And it's just gotten stronger and more profound with the four heresies of the West that 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 AJ uh, so eloquently introduced me to. And I was able to integrate into my own conversation about these issues um but but as each heresy uh you know what we got you know d the scientific method okay. democracy yeah. computer technology and then artificial intelligence will be the last one um with with each one which has grown exponentially across time and will continue to we just see women kowtow to the the, the impulse to be selfish and and if you follow uh the model of Jesus Christ or any of the great heroes in any of our classical uh, literature, um, what, what seems to make a man, a man, and what seems to make a man, a really good man distinguished from other men is the impulse or the, the, the valuing of self-sacrifice. Um, and, and that self you know, Mary wept at the, at the cross. Right. And, you know, it's just, uh, th this this is an, an an age old story, but but men tend to to drift towards that that understanding of self sacrifice, and and rightfully so. So that's you know, restraint 
and self-sacrifice. Roy, why don't we'll go back the we'll snake back the other way. Would you mind, Royce, uh, just are saying saying a word about why each of these four heresies of the West are heresies of the West for for the audience who might not be familiar with this? I, I think this will help direct the convo. I think I could. I think I, yeah, I could. I could do it. Um, I, well, the, the scientific method, in my opinion, and AJ can can probably elaborate on this much better than I can even. But uh, my general sense of it is that the scientific method was a, a an attempt by man to uh let's say close the gap between himself and god through uh mathematical equation um and that if we could if we could close that gap then the will will be clarified then then people will just generally become good because it's that sort of lack of of uh, of, of existential knowledge that drives man to a curiosity that then preempts bad behavior, uh, completely off base, especially from a theological standpoint, which begs the question why so many people who claim to believe in God were involved in the inception of a lot of science to, to begin with. But, um, you know, democracy took it to the next level and sort of said, well, we can't, we can't close the gap quick enough. So the next way to, to sort of, um, create a, a general moral goodness is to have a, a consensus, uh, you know, a, a yeah. general majority yeah. consensus. And that yeah. if everybody agrees, no matter what degree of sin there is, it's kind of offset by the fact that everybody came to this conclusion as one, one group. Um, computer technology just went way off uh, in the left field and and basically said, hey, the human the human intellect and the human will can't be clarified at all. It's it's going to take too long for that. So uh, let, let's see if we create an artificial uh, sort of intelligence, then maybe the artificial intelligence will close the gap for us and, and create that moral standard. Um, and then art of, I mean, uh, that, that that's computer technology. And then or the sort of you could say this sort of a uh, that that the problem was the bandwidth, right? You know this this belief that the problem with the human in, intellect was a bandwidth issue. So if we could if we could uh, get past the bandwidth issue, now we close the gap. And then artificial intelligence is just let's put it all on yeah. steroids. Let's let's just opt for the fastest, most radical inhuman thing possible. It's it's the the ultimate rejection of humanity, right? It's like we can't do this. All right. We have no way of being able to, to be moral and good. So let's see if we if we build a super, super intelligent computer, then maybe it'll be able to do it for us, even if it's at the expense of us um, in, in general. I like that. Yeah, let me let me let me just uh, first off, Royce, that was a, a great snops of it. I think one of the ideas behind this, though, is that at each iteration, they thought, oh, this is the answer. So they go in the 1500s. Right circle the time of that the scientific method really in its root form starting to come up and come about they go you know we have all these sort of disputes over what is truth how do we arrive at it so they go here what we're going to do is we're going to establish a method all these things are sort of methodological we're going to establish a method that we can then just pinpoint truth and then there's no dispute and then we'll have peace and of course when that falls apart then they go well let's now move to democracy so at least like roy said if all the people agree then that well then when that falls apart which it evidently did, they go, okay, well now, uh, you know, technology will be the saving grace. This will be the thing, like Roy said, it expands that bandwidth, right? Okay. And now we'll be able to sort of arrive at this sort of peacefulness. And then I'm, he's the one who added artificial intelligence, but it's a perfect addition where it goes, let's just punt on all of it and just, uh, here, throw these robots into the mix and, and make it perfect, uh, from there. So, yeah, we no longer want to be stewards of the earth. Let Siri do it. Yeah. Uh, let yeah. some robot clean my house like the Jetsons. And one thing I want to add that I really liked uh, your point, your set of points, Royce, the discourse on method, which is the birthplace of solipsism uh, as officially expressed in, in Western philosophy, is um, that where we attempted to get procedurally really rigorous for the reasons that you expressed well, that's where man turned inward. I mean, this this can almost singularly be noted as the moment, the Cartesian moment. It's it's Descartes' discourse on method. I was looking for it. I have it somewhere on my desk. Yep. I have tomes of uh, philosophy now that I have to read for my oral comps in my PhD program. I was just looking at the discourse on method. This is where man turned inward. 
And remember, mm-hmm. Descartes wasn't any great empiricist. This is the opposite of what he, he, he was. He was a yeah. rationalist solipsist. He's supposed to be arguing against these cor- corpuscularian guys. These guys all believed in corpuscles. Most of them believed in magic, like with ICK at the ending. So Divine, the Hey, help me out with that corpuscles. I don't know that word. Corpuscles are like magic atoms because these, oh, right. okay. these folks had rejected. And I'm talking Hume, Hobbes, Locke, Gassendi, Descartes. So the big rivals in the school of modern philosophy are supposed to be the empiricists and the rationalists, right? Well, you find they all believed in the same stuff aside from the ultimate. Where, where's the source of knowledge? Is it is it a priori or a posteriori? And yet they all believe in corpuscles because it was all predicated on an overturn of Aristotelian mm-hmm. hylomorphism, which is to say just, just philosophy that, that form is in matter metaphysics are real metaphysics is all around us so they have to make this turn to corpuscles turn to magic alchemy it's really phenomenal what you note when you look to early modern philosophy when these guys like the like copernicus had thought they'd refound the center of the universe and it wasn't aristotle the intellectual universe it was solipsism so I'm glad you pointed that out, Royce. And arguably, that's when men took to inwardness, which is not our nature. I mean, the best philosophy, by the way, comes not from a. I'm not saying inward in the sense of philosophizing and, and invested in speculative science. No, I mean the best philosophy came from the day, the Athenian Enlightenment, from high scholasticism. It reached its uh, zenith. It came from when men were outward. So as concerns men and women, I think it's really interesting that men turned inward at the Enlightenment and and women are trying to turn outward. Now, in every philosophy department across the land, including even faithful Catholic ones, Thomistic departments, they're always trying to point out, you know, Ariel Durant, Hannah Durant, that they we don't need to involve women in the history of speculative philosophy. I didn't know if um, if Will, then Elliot, then Mike wanted to take a crack at this, but it's it's a really strong point that, that Royce made. Yeah, there's a theme of inversion there, isn't it? So Royce and AJ were talking about basically man wanting to be God and having that mastery over nature. That's Francis Bacon's phrase, mastery over nature. And that becomes the desire for mastery of human nature as well conceived as part of that natural order that they have to control and dominate so it's not a surprise then that we end up with questions about what is a man what is a woman can we make them into whatever we want them to be can we invert the proper roles so that man no longer fulfills his traditional function connected to being a father so that woman no longer fulfills her function connected to be a mother we can just be whatever we want to be And AI ultimately is connected to transhumanism too, completely getting rid of the status of being a creature. You can invent yourself as whatever you want, put a chip in your head, et cetera, or this wearable biotechnology. So I think it's spot on to say that in some deep sense, it's about the desire to challenge God for supremacy. So there's something satanic about that. Satan originally wanting to be equal to God and denying his own status as a creature. And then the other point we're looking at, what do we mean by starting inside with this Cartesian model rather than outside, like St. Thomas says, philosophy begins in wonder, begins with the recognition of that which is outside us. I think it's a dulling of the senses to the glory of creation, ultimately, in the book of nature. That's what philosophy is, really. I think it's the way in which men most connect to the divine. Natural reason starts with that. Scripture comes afterwards with revelation, but philosophy for men is, if you talk to most guys about whatever spiritual difficulties they're having or some of the deep crises in their lives, a lot of it is philosophical content. Men get really bothered by ideas and abstractions in a way that women tend not to, in my experience anyway. Yeah, that's great. 
Uh, you know, I wonder what the ultimate end of this is, and I can't help but to think of the story of the prodigal son, right? Like, so technology is a gift from God, given that God is intelligible. And so a lot of these things are just understanding a God, God a bit better by the gifts he's provided us with. Uh, as it relates to the prodigal son, it's almost like we take in the gifts that God have given us, our inheritance. Uh, and rather than being grateful for it, we say, give me that, you owe it to me and run. And so we go and we spend it in the glory of ourselves as we seem to be doing in this world, which ultimately ends up yeah. with eating with the pigs. And so we're marveling at ourselves with the inheritance that we've stolen and ran away from our father with no gratitude. Uh, I can only imagine it as a matter of time. In fact, we might already be there where we're eating with the pigs. And so we, at some point, very soon, I assert, will come to our senses and there will be ha there will have to be a global repentance and turnaround because we're going to destroy ourselves and realize that it is by God's grace, by God's gift. Uh, this is all sustained by our father and wonderfully he will accept us back, I guess, if we repent. I think that's very well said. And I just wonder to what degree, what, what does that repentance look like in relation to our relation to technology and this, this runaway dependence that we seem to be having on computers, on, you know, soft uh, uh, AI, uh, on uh, these digital interfaces. I mean, at, at some point, uh, do we need to get back to the land? Do we need to get back to our bodies? Do we need to get back to nature and, uh, and living more natural, na natural lives, you know, the Catholic land movement, uh, you know, stuff that uh, uh, Belloc and um, uh, what's the uh, Chesterton? Yeah, I was singing the um, the 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 poet. Uh, oh, yes, yes, sir. Um, you know what I'm talking about? You're talking about the American one. Culture and agriculture. What? Uh, a big. Um, I Alan name. Tate. Alan Tate was a uh, one of the Southern agrarian writers. It's um, um that. that it wasn't that, but I mean, it's it, it, that same idea though. You know, like to to what degree is that an antidote, or uh, at least a way of repenting, or of of slowing down some of the the perniciousness uh, that we just talked about uh, in in these areas. Uh, so I, I guess that's that's my only sort of additional thought to, to this thread. I mean, the only way is a return to the father. Right. And we've seen this play out in the scriptures over and over again. Right. And so it's like when uh, 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 Jonah, is that the dude that ended up in the well because he didn't want to tell people to repent and turn around and return to the father. Um, I can't imagine it being much different. I don't think it's going to come in the way of the you know Freemasonic. Uh, fraternity and love for the earth and creation worship, it will be a return to Christ and it will be a return to the father through Christ. And there's no other way. Yeah. I think, I think it's, there's an interesting progression from method, scientific method specifically to democracy, to hyperinflated dependence uh, ubiquitously on technology. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, particularly with this key concept of solipsism. I note that everywhere, the second thing I was going to talk about was male restraint. The art of male restraint is arguably another name for politics in the polis, you know, d d uh, the disposition of, of city rules from within the polis. And here's the thing, democracy is tyranny it's the tyrannical form of representative rule everywhere in our republic our fallen republic folks refer to it as a democracy it's an interesting psyop democracy 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 we live in a republic the article four of the u.s constitution guarantees our republican form of government mm -hmm. it literally guarantees it to each of the several states Re republic is for for Aristotle and Plato and St. Thomas, one of the three good regimes, one of the three good forms of rule. 
democracy is its spoiled, uh, corrupted degradation. Each of the three good regimes has a spoiled, corrupted degradation. Uh, monarchy has tyranny. Aristocracy becomes oligarchy when it becomes spoiled and corrupt. Republic becomes a democracy. The rule by techne, the obsession with technology, vice becoming virtue, uh, license becoming substituted in the popular mind for liberty, women becoming our leaders and the ones doing philosophy. Popular philosophy is the view, right? Women leading an abstract thought. Everything is upside down in the corrupted republic. We uh, uh, This is just uh, Royster's citation of the four great heresies is um, perfect today. It, it literally contours every everything I was going to say in this discussion. So uh, who, who wrote the book, uh, Liberty, the God that fell? Was it Deneen, Mike? No, that's Hoppe. Deneen did. Uh, Lib- no, no. Hoppe's no. Democracy, the God that failed. Oh, De- why De- liberalism De- failed is Deneen. Deneen is why liberalism failed. Chris Ferraro wrote Liberalism, the God that failed. I'm still not sure what liberalism is. Will and I were talking about this earlier in the week. But Hoppe, <laughs> Hans, Hans Hermann Hoppe wrote Democracy. The God that failed. And that's far more like it. Why are folks in a female run culture in a in a most in, in what's fast becoming a female run politics? Why are folks so quick on the left and the right? The Uniparty refers to our what was originally a non-democratic republic like Hoppe wanted our. I guess, democratic republic at this point as a straight democracy. I think that has something to do with the tyranny by consensus, whereby a man thinks he can be a woman, the tyranny by consensus where a wife thinks she can surrogate for all the roles of a husband and vice versa. The tyranny by consent is what marks everything in society. It is that subjectivity that that we talked about that's that's uniquely female in the vicious way. I, I, I'm married to a very virtuous woman. She doesn't she doesn't go around committing these sins uh, during the day. But I'm, and I'm sure your guys' wives don't either, but all of this is very, very interconnected to the notion of the inward turn of men and the outward turn of females seems to be the watchword in a democracy. Why in the hell does everyone go along with this intentional seeming conflation of democracy for republic? It's because it's so pleasing to be our own gods, right? Like with a monarchy or, uh, you know, where, where we have a king, right? The idea is that they, there is a authority. There is a hierarchy. There is somebody that is more fit and able to lead me and make better decisions for me, uh, especially if it's from a moral, you know, moral high ground. If there's, if the church is intertwined with the state in that way. Uh, but to say that I am the Lord of my own life and I make all the best decisions for what I need because of the way I feel leads us to this place where, well, of course, it's pleasing to the ego. Why would you want anything else? Yeah, can I can I jump in here too? I'm thinking, uh, Tim, you referenced this maybe this past week from Aristotle that 95% of people roughly are going to fall into the category of seeking pleasure as their means to happiness. So I think of the democracy from the the scale of this is a means to an end and the end that you're going to get if you broaden the scope wide enough right is going to be pleasure it's going to be vice it's going to be all the things that a person is inclined in their sinful nature to want and so i think it doesn't it doesn't even have to be sort of planned out top down though that doesn't dismiss the fact that the, the devil's there ordering it in a sort of structured uh, internal internal logical way um, but what you have is democracy is this sort of people just, they have an instinct for it. Like, oh, this is going to open up all the possibilities that I might want because it's going to place vice at the top, at the top of the food chain for all of us. If, if we make the, the masses, the, the populace wide enough, then we're just going to be able to default to all the sort of vicious, uh, visceral habits, things that we're going to want. So that, that's what comes to mind for me. Dude, you AJ, you're describing in satisfying detail plato's description of republics becoming corrupted and becoming democracies in book eight of the republic uh it Shout seems next 
Yeah, shout out Plato. I, I'm not a Platonist. He gets so much wrong that, that that Aristotle has to clean up really a lot. But but listen to what <laughs> listen to what he says. And I, I just happened to I'm working my way through the first few books of the Republic, which I never did because uh-huh. I have to read all these books for the doctoral program. But listen to that. It seems then that we must next consider democracy, how it comes into being, and what character it has when it does. So that knowing in turn the character of a man who resembles it, we can present him for judgment. Um, is it, uh, listen to how close this is to what AJ just said. Think of the turn to the effeminate at every turn when you listen to uh, Plato's description of democracy. Isn't the city changed from oligarchy to a democracy in some way such as this because of its insatiable desire to attain what it has set before itself as the good, namely the need to become as rich as possible? This is just a slightly slightly classier version of the apolostic life. It's just materialism. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, in America, we don't even any longer distinguish between old money and nouveau riche, which is at least some sort of dis- social distinction by which society can distinguish uh, the good from the bad, the great from the small. And, and, and uh, Socrates is asked in what way? Since those who rule in the city do so because they own a lot, I suppose they're unwilling to enact laws to prevent young people who've had no discipline from spending and wasting their wealth so that by making loans to them secured by the young people's property and then calling these loans in, they themselves become even richer and more honored. Uh, your, your, so your point's perfect, AJ. The, uh, there's another spot in here. I just happened to grab the Republic and I, I knew roughly where this spot is in book eight of the Republic. I, I'm going to find it when someone else is talking, but the move to absolute consensus is in the catholic intellectual tradition what is condemned as liberalism uh liberalism does not mean a belief in liberty as ordered freedom that that is always good that is always a virtue and what we have now is a fascinating social and cultural and political situation along the catholic right where they're essentially these guys that are calling for autocratic theocratic authoritarian catholic rule which i don't i don't even believe most of them who are calling for it really want it i think a lot of it's crypto socialism but the, i mean they're doing so in a way which condemns liberty right. simplicitaire and, and what they really need to be condemning is democracy democracy is what gave us feminism homosexualism, transgender, because all you have to do is say, hey, look, if we can get 51 percent of the people to vote that that um, a woman can have a penis, then a penis she has. You know, what well, we were kind of talking about this earlier in the week. Yeah, I think it'd be more accurate to call it the the demon that seduced and for now has succeeded rather than the God that failed. That's Elliot's point about the temptation of idolatry, because what you're bringing out in those comments, Tim, is that it's an attractive idea that we can make our own rules and that all political power doesn't come from God. Ultimately, it just rests in the people and whatever they decide, they bring that about. So if people decide gay marriage by vote, then so be it. Any sense of natural law. So the way that humans are created to be man and woman, he created them that goes out of the window based on lust, greed, pride, whatever it might be. This is this is one of the lines I wanted to find in the Republic. Just kick it to you guys. Isn't democracy's insatiable desire for what it defines as the good? Also, what destroys it? What do you think it defines as the good? The answers freedom surely you'd hear a democratic city say that this is the finest thing it has so that as a sm- as, as a result it is the only city worth living in for someone who is by nature free yes you often hear that his interlocutor says then as a, I, I can't remember if this is uh glaucon who's actually plato's brother or adamantus at this point in book eight then as, as i was about to say doesn't the insatiable desire for freedom and the neglect for other things change this constitution and put it in need of a dictatorship. That's where we're at right now because the city, because a republic, which is ordered after a kind of bounded male liberty, ordered freedom, you have all kinds of, of cooling mechanisms. The Senate was supposed to give, uh, Madison says in Federalist 51, the cool and deliberate sense of the people. It's not supposed to just be 
the people vote whatever they want. The Senate's supposed to say, guys, chill out. You can't be a woman. You can't be a woman, dude. <laughs> You're supposed to have laws coming from senators in theory uh, that, that are a stop block. And now these folks that have failed to distinguish between good representative rule, which orders liberty, bad representative rule, which which hails license. Now the guys that seem to have wanted a dictator all along, I think a lot of these Catholic post-liberals are enjoying this a bit too much for my taste. And they're saying, I guess we need the dictator now. Listen to Adrian Vermeule. He's, he's like, I guess we need the dictator now. Well, this is uh, the next phase of Plato's political explanation, right? Is that we go from timarchy to oligarchy to democracy, then to tyranny. So, you know, I wonder to what degree... Yeah, I wonder what, to what degree is this an inevitable slide, and uh, we're heading towards that. Or we're we're beginning to see this this tip from a uh, a non Christian nation to an anti Christian nation, and then uh, tyranny of some form uh, arising. I've always had a penchant for democracy. <laughs> I, I think that's just because it means power to Tim, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just a little dad joke. Uh, it's supposed to mean military rule by soldiers. Yeah, and it's part of this dissent, Mike. But I, I don't know. I'm real. I'm gen- so. This is a whole other topic for a whole other show. Uh, me and Will, I think, are going to do a a one on one, one v one show, or one one with one show on this weird slide into post liberalism and the embrace by the quote unquote new right of. I guess we just need a dictator. Uh, Sora Bamari, I think, maybe I'm wrong, tweeted something like, I'm just ready for the Chinese rule. And people didn't go apeshit. <laughs> something like that. Do you remember? He said he said that about a, a year and a half ago. And I was like, WTF? Excuse me? And something like that. And, and maybe I'm getting the particular post-liberal wrong. I think it was Sorab, though. And it's like, I'm not. I'm not, dude. And yes, America might be big, fat uh tranny and evil now but i'm not ready for for china that's where all this shit's coming from so well, well yeah. yeah well one i was gonna go back and just say it's not by accident that uh liberalism communism and and the third prominent one neoclassicism all stem from uh, a descartes post enlightenment mm-hmm. philosophy and you know it it's it's my if you if you look at it across a long enough time timeline um communism and liberalism are two sides of the same coin obviously and that their roots are the same uh and and liberalism is is sort of you know you talk about the slide from democracy to tyranny the illusion of liberalism being a, a liberty freedom based philosophical uh, framework is was was and is always um you know a, a precept for a communist framework which then becomes authoritarian uh almost by definition because number one there is no god in it so the highest authority has to be the state um and you know i think what, what we see is a a massive opt for the center and this is a crisis mm-hmm. of leadership right the the fact that um, it's, 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 it's not in, in this, I think people have to become very courageous in their willingness to adventure into new Catholic and Christian ideological formation, which my young brother, um, AJ has done at, at 31 years old in his new book. I don't even know if I can say it, Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, sure but he, he, he recently, you know, finished a work called advanced Christianity. And I think we, we spend so much time with scripture that, <clears throat> which is also a failure of leadership and a failure of, of faith and courage to, to kind of, uh, articulate these things in, in real time based on, on the circumstance of where we are. And it's the same crisis of leadership we see in politics, right? That, um, people have become accustomed to uh, gravitating towards the leader that will say the thing that makes them feel good, right? There, there's, there's an inward feeling based um, way to, to measure the standard by which we choose our leaders. And, and the, the, the standard bearer of the day is centrism, 
right? And and no real good change, no real good, no change. Let's just say for starters, no change in the most general sense comes from the center. The entire MO, the entire modus operandi of the center is to create an ever expanding center and, and, and to bring as many people into that ever expanding center as possible by which, by way of the, the best safeguard to create an ever expanding center is to designate that all the periphery are actually enemies of the good. Uh, and, and so no real new ideas are are even generated. And that's kind of why you hear um, these leftists, uh, progressivists talk in a way that seems like it's spirited and, 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 and oriented towards the innovative. But people who really know can tell that they're not really saying anything. Right. Because we see it from that broader existential and, and, and intellectual contemplative lens. That's true and, and, and right. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 grift or the, the the gravity towards the center is apparent, and and the crisis at the center is leadership. That the the leaders that we have plan to 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 say whatever it is that that the people want versus what the people need, um, and and that goes back to that self sacrifice point I made before. Is you know what what does it mean for a man to be good? And, and at what point do we acknowledge that self-sacrifice is at the heart of that, not what man can accomplish? Right. I think this sort of this sort of grandiose, self-aggrandized sense of accomplishment and, and uh, is, is also at the heart of it. Yeah. Can I can I jump in here? And I'm I'm thinking here about uh, Royce and I have talked about this at length and I know he shots him out. But Alexander Dugan's book, The Fourth Political Theory. And I I I hear people say that he's supposed to be taboo. I don't know. I, I can't figure out why, but I think that he best frames the political dichotomy today. Most people, you know, they go left and right. Or they go, oh, this is old. This is dead. I hear like, you know, I hear British intellectuals talk about like uh, anywheres versus somewheres, like people who can live anywhere versus people who can live somewhere. All that pales in comparison to Dugan's contrast between the center and the peripheral, centrist and the periphery. And, and he points out that um, for people, you know, right and left, the uniparty, they are much more interested in drawing everyone into the center than they are doing anything that acknowledges the periphery around it. And so I think in a, in a stable populace, you have the periphery that have some real strength, even if they're separate from one another, they have some real strength and merit to counter the centrists. And that that impulse toward authoritarianism comes from the people who go, let's just make the center as big as possible. And then this circles right back to our comments on democracy, right back to what you referenced, Tim, with Plato, which is that if we make the center big enough, then it's just going to be the lowest common denominator. And our base passions are going to rule the day. And I'm going to get to do what I want. I'm going to get to you know smoke weed when I want. I'm going to get to jerk off when I want. I'm going to get to go you know drink with the boys and get hammered whenever I want. And everything else is going to fo follow from there. So, well, what? Re yeah, rhetorically, it, it sounds so, so good. It sounds so commonsensical. What, wouldn't we all, all want to be in the center, right? We wouldn't want to be extremists. Extreme <laughs> yeah. is bad. Center <laughs> yeah. is good. So it ends, it ends up being this, this perversion of the Aristotelian mean taken to a, a political uh, uh, conversation, but like on the on the face value, people go, yeah, I want to be an extremist. Uh, the the good must somehow always lay in the center because I don't know. That's what I've been told. Well, uh, and the, let let's be clear about like if we're talking about centrism and the politics or globalism, for example, by another nomenclature, you you there there would be no problem with a true Christian globalism. And and AJ is you know we we've talked about this before, but the 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 root of the problem with the centrists phenomenon is that it's based and anchored on an immoral it's on the status quo it, it which, which right? but, it's on the base the status quo came from the impulse to try and be god right right, right. so the, the the status quo itself at inception was a heresy and was a rejection and, and a blasphemy against god so therefore the trajectory of it has always stayed on course to be this sort of this uh th th this false center and that's what I think Dugan's trying to point out about the periphery, because the periphery are actually not along this false political dichotomy, you know, this this dichotomy. And, and so when you see people call for the center, it's not so much that they're calling for the center, it's that they're calling for a, a corrupt center. And then on top of that, they're yeah. they're also weak leaders because their impulse to bring you to a corrupt center is that they don't have the actual merit of goodness. Yeah. So so now 
when the Overton window is applied, the center gets shifted over one way to the left. And now they call for the new center, which is always drifting more and more towards Satan in a, in a more existential sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And can I, can I rejoin her that the status quo to me, and I'm not saying anyone else has to adopt this, but the status quo to me, isn't merely what happened before and what is continuing now. The status quo is the sort of gravity toward those basis of passions that's there in, in the old world. It's there at the time of Christ. It's there today, right? The, the general sort of gravity of man in our sinful nature and our concupiscible nature is to just tend toward that. And so the status quo is not a continuation of what's happened before, other than the fact that it's sort of that continuation of the concupiscible human nature toward those things. So AJ, I wanted to ask you what, just quickly, what regime do you think would situate uh, some sort of elevation that you're, that, that Dugan's after of the, the fringes or whatever, whatever he he calls it. I don't know. It seems like I'll I'll actually point to you here on this one, Tim, because I really like the work you've done on Catholic Republic. And when I hear you talk politics, it uh, it resonates for me. It, it strikes me on a deeper level than what I hear elsewhere. And so I really like what you say about Republic, the res publica and the nature of that sort of um, subsidiarity. Right. And and so I think something along those lines, I, I Royce and I talk about this regularly, but I feel there's a sort of tendency uh, that should be in there against federalism. And I don't know that you maybe make an abstract number, but it certainly seems like in America today, we have different sort of cultural center, general consensus. The East Coast is different than the Southeast, which is different than the West Coast, which is different than the Midwest. And there's any number of variation within there, but it seems like those are kind of distinct, distinct enough cultural lines. And there's something where once you start having some system of governance, a, a federalism, that spans across those, it just gets distorted really quick. So, you know, I'm one who always says, all right, what are the strengths and weaknesses, right? Monarchy, strengths and weaknesses are if you have a good monarch, it's the best system there is. If you have a bad monarch, it's probably the worst system that there is. Democracy, and this is that sort of the beta male project, as Royce calls it, democracy has the value of sort of uh, the least downside, they would say, right? They would think, you know, the the sort of the, the room for error is sort of the smallest, but you also get the most milk toast system as a consequence. And I'm, I, I'm not one who inclines toward that, right? As a, as an athlete myself, yeah, I have a competitive, a, a healthy competitive nature, and I, and I can spot anti-competitiveness, which isn't just being non-competitive; it's trying to distort it and invert it <laughs> so that it looks like it's competitive because all the fruits and the spoils go to the one who's actually a good competitor. So they want the image of it being competitive. And I, I mean, we, which I could is, rant is, forever for a long time on this. Which is, to, to, to throw a lob in, is, which is what makes uh, the NBA a neoliberal yes. Marxist. It's anti-competitive now, yeah. right? It yeah. wants, LeBron wants to be seen as the best competitor while calling for every single little foul and tic-tac thing and whining. I mean, it used to be a sort of offense against one's own sensibility to even show, to even show a sort of pain at some sort of foul that happened to you, right? Like it, it was, it, no one had to teach me that. I had a natural dignity to go, I am not going to give you the satisfaction of standing up after this and be like, oh, how, how, how did you do that? Like, well, did you see that ref? And so, I, I mean, that's where I, I look at it and I say, democracy strikes me as very anti-competitive. Yeah. Um, not a competitive, right? Anti-competitive. And so I go, all right, Whatever it is, we need to fit it. I, I'm open to that. You fit the one to the times, right? Because it's only the heavenly kingdom where that, that order, that stability is going to be perfect. And so here on earth, I don't, you know, I don't look at it and say, well, America's the saving grace. But I look at it like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's profound and maybe, maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong in that, right? But there's something that that republic seems to be pretty dynamic and well-suited to this time. But I think I, I mean, I think as Roy said, we're heading toward what we deserve, which is a sort of totalitarian, authoritarian. Your old boy who said, um, you know, I, I'm ready for China. Like, man, if that's what if that's what we're headed toward and that's what we're going to get. Well, all right. Well, then I got to I got to bear down the hatches and yeah. start working on it. <laughs> and, and I think just to add one one, you know. Note to, to what you're saying here is um, I think people have the big the big pitfall of people is 
because we have blocked ourselves off from being able to see through a through a lens that's more connected to God uh, and, and more gravitates towards sin and Satan, we we uh, we instinctively try to look at all of these issues in two dimensions, flat, right, diametrically opposed, black and white. When really the spiritual is much more three dimensional, if not four dimensional. And, and so, you know, the Marx, the, the problem with Marx was, well, number one, he probably was doing it intentionally and he knew full well what he was doing because the time was much more intellectual. But but the problem with the people who look at things through a through a Karl Marx sort of lens is um, they see the king, the the unjust king as being unjust, not because he's immoral or not good. They see him as unjust because they don't have what he has. And there's a difference in that. Yeah. Right. I mean, and you know, and it's, it's so it's not, and this is the call for a lot of the Marxists is not uh, we should go back to a more natural minimalist way. It's we want to be rich. We want to be, we want to be, we, we want to have unlimited sin. It, it yeah, looks to yeah. us that Je- this is when AOC calls for Jeff Bezos's head in that sort of, you know, hyperbolic superficial way. She's not saying, Hey, I want to be moral and good. I want to be closer to the natural way. I want to live in, in a way that's uh, that's more uh, centered in logic. Now she's saying, I want to be Jeff Bezos. Be and the Jeff, fact yeah. that I can't be him, uh, makes makes this whole thing a, a, a shady deal. But the problem with it is when you go to democracy, you have a bunch of mini Jeff Bezos. You have a bunch, a bunch of mini Jeff Bezos in their in their spirit and in their ambition. They just don't have the, the economic means. So the people who actually see the problem with Jeff Bezos as an unjust king. Uh, they never even get a voice. They're the periphery. They're the people who they call extremists and radicals and, you know, Christo, Christo fascists or whatever yeah, else they're right. they're saying. So, you know, that's that's kind of what, what I've been um, coming coming to understand lately is that people tend to talk about these things in two dimensions. And, and, and the black and white is, is a failure of the, the broader the broader truth. And yeah, one ultimately- last thing I want to shout out what Mike was saying there about that sort of desire to be in the center. I mean, that that's the fifth precept of the natural law is an inclination toward living in society, right. And toward affability and gregariousness, like that, that is wired into us to want to get along with others and to want to sort of deescalate things and to harmonize with others. And that's a good thing. Right. And so, yeah, I, I mean, again, all these things, right. It's they're showing you one thing here and they're working something else. Under the, the right, under the yeah. right auspices. Yeah. It's good to want to get a, it's, it's no, it's no manner of, of, of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Yes. Right. And that's why, you know, we, we, we failed to go back and, and identify the scientific method, uh, democracy, the industrial revolution and industry itself. Right. And, and the need for a, a, an expansion of usury in order to execute oh. an, an, uh, a, 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 a time period of, of industry and then to exponentially grow it in order to have the, the technocratic industry, the industrialized society we have today, all along the way, there's, there's been very few people who stood up and go, is, does any of this make sense? Right. If you ask, does any of modern society's makeup make sense? You're considered a, a, a kook. And it's like, no, only the people who are asking the question, does any of what we do today make sense, have any chance of actually leading us back to a more healthy place? And there's just such a profound rejection against those people that I, I become sort of pessimistic about the outcome. <laughs> well, you wanted to say something. You, I think you started saying something, Will. Yeah, AJ and Royce have just made a couple of points that I want to combine and pick up on. I think taking politics out of the left, right, paradigm is a useful way to look at it instead think of it more in terms of heaven hell because ultimately it's about spiritual matters and what we've got with royce's point about liberalism and communism being connected is actually a two-pronged attack on the family if you like Um, marx said that the key to the destruction of the holy family he was a big hater of religion is the destruction of the earthly family. And what you get with liberalism is basically dissolving it. So it's an attack on the principle of solidarity. And then what you get with communism is absorbing it. And it's an attack on the principle of subsidiarity. And 
Tim, your comments about people longing for this strong man to come in and save the day, that is akin to the totalitarian socialist state of communism in that it's got no respect for the ordered hierarchy and the authority of the family within that. So both angles, it's an attack on the family. And that comes back to the point about what man is naturally meant for and how men and women have complementarity for that family unit and for the sake of children, which is the fundamental social cell. And unless we get that right, then nothing else following from that mistake is going to be founded on secure ground at all. Yeah, my problem with regard to what Royce last said and what you just said, Will, is yes, none of the politicians make any sense now. They're 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 dealing in architectonic of the bespoiled. Nothing makes any sense. But the problem that frightens me more than the cultural landscape, the political landscape, is that none of the commentators who are critics, like those on the Catholic New Right, none of their solutions make any sense either. And it's one thing to find yourself in some sort of uh, doomsday reality where it looks weird all around and we're unplugged and we're outside the matrix and it's ugly, which is basically 2022. Welcome to clown world. <laughs> but it's another thing to hear fellow Catholics who claim to be masculinists, who claim to be to get it. They, they claim to be traditional in a lot of ways. It's scary to hear all of their solutions not making sense. In other words, where we've gone, which is down down the tubes, we are we, we were a republic. We became doubtlessly this corrupted, queer, feminist, feminist first, feminist, then queer, now transsexual. Now, what the hell next? Democracy. The solution is always in the small. It's not in the big. The solution is in household fathers. This is the conceptual unity that runs like a blue thread through all of my books. It's Catholic Republic. The small, small is beautiful. Pius IX loved what Jefferson Davis was doing in the South. Not because slavery is good, it's evil, but because he likened it to what uh, uh, Victorio Emanuele had done to him, what Lincoln did to the South forced unification among all these competing interests over a vast land, land span. That doesn't make sense. Um, the politics, like you and I were discussing earlier in the week, Will, is natural. Thomas Aquinas and Bellarmine said politics is natural. It's just ruled by fathers, uh, patriarchy. It and, and of course, Locke and Algernon Sidney and then Jefferson and all those guys just basically plagiarized Bellarmine but they they bought this enlightenment distinction that politics is synthetic it's not natural if you remember how natural politics are you'll remember how small government should be whether you have a king an aristocracy or a or a republic yeah. and and that's what's most dead in our society is fathers ruling their kids elliot said something last week and me and mike have talked on the phone a couple times about it and we're like what do we do about this me and elliot were talking about how do you intentionally father your sons? Uh, he, he, Elliot made a great point. And I was talking about how I intentionally father my one son. I have six girls and one son. So I have to demarcate a specific difference in how I treat him. It's You have to be very intentional about this. And I made this comment and Elliot just said some beautiful things about what he does, waking his son up early, going for hikes it was really inspiring. It inspired both me and Mike. And I was saying, yeah, I do this too, but I'm like, shit, I need to, I need to do more of that even after hearing Elliot's remark. And then Mike, Mike and I started talking and we still have yet to flesh this out in a long conversation. We were asking each other like, wow, that, that was so intentional. And that sounds naturally good and right. Rule by fathers, rule by a father in a household. And all the households in the polity are supposed to be doing this. And that's how we get ourselves to heaven. That's a that's an ideology of politics of heaven is just being ruled by fathers who love us uniquely. No state ruler, no king has the ability to love us like our father. And yet almost no one I know 
from a broken household, from a non-broken household, from an overtly feminist household, from a covertly feminist household, parents together or divorced. No one I know that's any of our ages. I think AJ is the youngest here, but anyone between 30 and my man Royce is two weeks younger than me. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. I thought I thought Royce was like two. Uh, he, he said young brother. Uh, you yeah, know. he did. In yeah. the general Sim- sense. Symbolically, yeah. you know, yeah, generally <laughs> That's, as, as a term of endearment. Yeah. Royce, you're a trans ageist, my friend. You yeah. think you can be uh, two weeks younger just by declaring it, by speaking it into the. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You'd be speaking. Tr- no, but I mean, no one I know that's anywhere from 30 to 50 was raised that way i mean maybe one of you guys were and you could tell us about it but i i'm not trying to complain in some freudian way here but man what me and elliot were talking about trying to do as fathers to our sons like this is the most important part of my day what clever ideas have i got about parenting my son about parenting my daughters uh that's something we're trying to do it's imperfect but I don't know that the boomers just didn't give a you know what about that. It, it was like the 90s, the 80s, the Simpsons. You know, it's it's a big joke that Homer's never thought about what does it require to 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 father his one son, Bart Simpson. This is the crisis. Like literally Benedict the 16th said the the, the mark of our day is absconding fathers. This is it. This is the key. This is the solution to culture and politics inside and outside the church is return to patriarchy, the case for patriarchy rule by fathers. And it is always small. It's household by household. It's not in a strong man. Whatever people want, the recoming, the second coming of Trump. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I like some, a lot of aspects about Trump. I like his Twitter account most of all, but um, I I don't think that this surrogacy of a strong man for the kind of subsidiary and government constitutive of rule by household fathers over their own affairs will ever bring people to the happiness that that they're imagining. Well, I I think absolutely you you're, you're right that these these sort of uh, you know puppet false idolization usually leads to puppet profits and, and a danger of puppet puppet profits um i will say that it, again if you look at and, and i like that elliot said that that technology was given to us by god i mean you could argue to what degree that is that is true but ultimately uh, it it was it it's about its application and use and it's about our will the will that we put into the technology and how we choose to use it. Um, the same thing could be said for societal structure and leadership. And I think that good leadership is, is, uh, is something to, I think leadership is something that's going to naturally emerge. Um, but, but it's something that we should focus on trying to clarify because, um, you know, m- men, men do need good role models, like you're saying, but even the men that we look to need, guidance and leadership right and it should come from right. biblical structure um or, or biblical scripture first but there is that lived that lived role model that people that people do need and that's what the church should be right or or, the, or that's what our politicians should be um the fact that right. we've the fact that we've uh defected away from that institutionally is what caused the boomers to uh, let's say it didn't cause it, but it played a great role in the justification of the boomers living the way that they did and still do. Um, so, 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 you know, I, I think, yeah, yes, the, the fathers, but, but how do, who did the boomers learn from and how did they become, how did they get that way? Right. It, it didn't just, didn't just happen. And there's a corrosion that's, that's linked to a sequence of, of events. And again, it, it stems, it stems back to, um, early, early accepted practices in, in our culture, uh, in, in modern society, especially in the West. And, and I think that, that, that crisis of leadership is, is, is profound. I mean, it, it really is the crisis of our day. Um, because, you know, even myself as a father, I have two young sons. If I wasn't fortunate enough to, to have a sort of divergent 
a, a divergent impulse to the mainstream thinking, um, you know, I, the things that I choose to do or not do with my kids would be all based on the technology that I consume. I mean, how do you how do you escape it? And you, you so let let uh, and I want to add this in as an even wider lens. If you go back to the battle between Satan and humanity, I view it as the oldest sibling rivalry, right? Uh, and and it's 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 ultimately you know you could say Satan's attempt to prove man unworthy uh, for the the preference the, the the preferential treatment that we receive from God, uh, and and then you know the 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 feminist impulse is is that we are made in god's image and so there's another sibling rivalry that that takes place there and our kowtow to the feminist impulse is intended to sort of distort the natural order or the inception of creation at the most fundamental level and that that's where the transgenderism comes from that's where the the move to that's why the feminist movement is aligned with the lgbtq movement and the and the shared uh target of both movements is toxic masculinity or christianity i mean it it tells on itself it reveals itself if if we're willing to just call it what it is that satan and women have joined together in their resent of God and his preferential treatment of making man in his image. And, and so, you know, yeah, men, we do need strong male leaders to combat that. I mean, yeah. you, we're yeah. in a war and in a war you need generals and, and your generals don't have to be there telling a man everything he should and shouldn't do, but to provide that, to be that Oak, you know, out there in the wilderness for men to be able to lean on and, and, and go to uh, when, when they're unstable, I think is, is a righteous, um, you know, a righteous strat strategy. Yeah. Righteous goal. I want to go to Elliot though. I like those. Le of course, that's what, I mean, that's what we're trying to do here to provide four or six Catholic dudes that are legitimately tr trying to hash this out once a week. That's what C mask is all about. And honestly, the best expression of it, I think we're six shows in if I could just be speak my mind is what Elliot said when he's like, this is what I do with my sons. And I, I don't even know if you know, Elliot, but it was like the subject me and Mike were talking a couple times the next week. Like this is profound just to hear how intentional a, a father uh, is supposed to try to be. And I, I try to do it too, but you expressed it better than I did. So I don't know if you know that I, I think this is the way. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's my job. It's my most important job, right? I have three other, I have four, four children, three others are daughters, but um, I prepare them to be good wives. I got to prepare my son to be a husband and to be a provider and to be a protector. So it's the first thing I do every day. So I get up and I train the boy, right? I was training my dogs for a while. Many people take that for granted, right? You walk your dog, everybody walks their dog in the morning, but then you throw your son onto a yellow bus to go be trained by middle-aged women, right? Yeah. So I, and I caught myself not, you know, we started homeschooling two years ago. I caught myself just letting my son be like the girls, right? They sleep in. I'm like, wait a second. I don't sleep in. Boy, you don't sleep in. And so I get up and I train my boy. It was beautiful. Yeah. Even, even, even rehashing it the second time. And it's simple is is beautifully put man so i'm not saying that no there shouldn't be natural male leaders in politics but this should be uh uh by participation in what they do in their households which is their first job it's really the vocation of uh of a father is to get his family to heaven that's how partly how he gets himself to heaven that's what the household of the priest or the mini church of the home the ecclesiola as jp2 called it that's how it works. It operates by, I get myself to heaven by getting my wife and kids to heaven. And so, of course, natural leaders should emerge in a healthy republic. But uh, my whole point was it should be small because men like Elliot, men like what I'm trying to be, are really busy with their families day by day. I would Homeschooling takes a lot of work. Now that I work from home, I'm like, this is striking how much work the homeschooling is, which I was just given to my wife when the kids were young. Now that I have middle schoolers, it takes a, it takes a few hours every morning. And, and, you know, I have one boy, six girls, 
the the main thing I note is when I've done an adequate job spending one on one time with them, you got to interact with them jointly and severally, you know, one and all uh, is I always get a kind of ping from natural law or the Holy Spirit or whatever it is like, OK, this is this is a good amount of time. We've done a good non token activity together. Now I need to move to the next one. It's a full time job being a dad. And representative rule is supposed to be like, OK, the men meet in the town hall at night, not every night because it's not a boys club, but once twice a month to uh, tend to the disposition of the city's laws. That's what representative rule is supposed to be. And it's supposed to be virtuous men that care about their families. And that's why they give a shit about the polis or the wider sphere of things, because like I care about my family first and foremost. That's what's the common good. It's smaller. It's not. It's not bigger. I, I just I I I got that same sense, Elliot, when you're describing it now as I did before. Can we talk a little bit about restraint? This is one thing I wanted to ask. This is one thing I wanted to ask all of you guys. Restraint politically is a male trait. I want to talk about restraint in our individual lives, even even being on the internet. All of us have enemies. <laughs> I try to restrain from all of the, the, I think it's masculine. When I was young, I was not a restrained man. You can ask, you can ask Steph. I, I, I think it's like, like that scene in Schindler's list where Schindler tries to convince the Nazi guard that no, what's, what's even more sublime than Nietzsche and will to power is restrained power. That that's truly a beautiful scene in that movie. And it's true. Restrained power is more powerful than raw power because you're holding it back and you're harnessing it. And uh, I didn't understand that as a young man. I was I was a, uh, a an impulsive, wild 18, 19, 20 year old. And so I, I try my best. People who follow me on Twitter know I don't always try perfectly. But I, man, there's some na people out there say some nasty things. Jay Dyer did a whole show on me the other day. Some other dude did a show on whatever. Uh, you got a bunch of Catholic podcasters, wives, you know, Trent Horn, Matt Frad's wives are still still haven't me forgiven me for writing this. You know, that did a skit comedy making fun of me. It was just tough to try. Look, I want to be a good man. I want to get to heaven. And I, I'm I'm naturally spirited as Plato says in book two of the Republic, I'm not naturally uh, calm. I'm, I'm naturally kind of a fighter. So how do you guys deal as other internet folk? How do you deal with all the shit talk on the internet? It's a nasty quagmire of a hellhole, the internet, but it's, it's kind of where we live and breathe. So what? Well, well I, I mean, I mean, I'm out there on point. I, I'm not, I'm, in, in, a, in a variety of ways from going from being a professional athlete and, and a public figure in that way to being sort of this mental health martyr at the at the center of political conversation and discourse uh, and, and then actually in politics and, and affiliated with a movement that is has has a lot of uh, mainstream technological energy uh, waged against it. Um, so, you know, in that I struggle it was actually this Kyrie Irving situation. And I saw Kyrie Irving speak a few times and, and, and we had the chance to connect a few times and, and his, uh, his sort of demeanor towards these things, as well as a person like AJ, AJ always makes me uh, look in the mirror when, when I talk to him and, and hear his temperance around certain issues and things. Um, but it made me rethink, you know, how, how I interact because my natural inclination is war. And I think that we, as, Christians and as Catholics have lost much of our uh, much of our belief that there are righteous and divine wars um, and and that war is a necessary is a necessary uh, tragedy in in some in, in some cases and we're in one and, and our failure to see a lot of these little incremental social political changes as of as a real war has as has uh caused us to be sort of docile and, and and overcome by them and then we sort of lie to ourselves and go oh no no we weren't overcome by that because the prayer in my home is still powerful it's like uh okay <laughs> i mean yeah. If you say so, you know, I mean, even the Vatican itself has a has has this issue, you could say. Right. It's just like 
the the level of arrogance and the the the, the naivety around around um, the the grandness of Satan's hands in these things is kind of profound to me, and I see it immediately in that person to person interaction on on the internet, right? And uh, at many times, I I do what many Christians would criticize as being wrath or rage, but it's not rage or wrath to me. Like when I if I tell you to. Uh, for, I won't say it here in, in in this good Catholic company, but if I if I say shut the f up, right? And many people will go, "You're angry." I'm like, "No, I'm not angry. I'm actually just telling this person that they don't really deserve to to have an opinion in this form or to demand my, my you know, the here here here's one of the things people do. You know, I'll go into some seven, you know, some six sentence you know, diatribe about the Federal Reserve. And then some one person will go, uh, you know, uh, you're scared to get on plane. So, you know, you know, deal with your fear of flying first and then you can talk about the Fed. And it's just like or they'll say something like, uh, you know, men don't talk in paragraphs. Right. So like to that, yes, I could ignore it or I could confront it. And yeah. it's it's just my in, in, intuition that our our lack of willingness to confront the petty, the petty uh, corrupt is what snowballs and amalgamates into a societal wide corrupt. And so every time I see it, if I have the chance, I mean, I don't let it consume my day, but if I'm sitting there on Twitter and I check it and somebody says something idiotic. I just, you know, shut the F up. You're a cuck. You're, you're a cuck. And, and I, well, I don't mean cuck in a traditional pornographic sense. I mean that if you, take cuck as somebody who lets another man sleep with his wife because of his own self-doubt and lack of strength, then many of us have become cucks for, for the establishment, for the government and for Satan. So I just tell people you're a cuck. And you know, that, that may be uh, not the best way to do it. I'm certainly not fit for a priestly role, uh, but, but I'm a, I'm a general out there on the front lines with, with, with a nine millimeter or a sword. And, and there are demons out there and, and those demons must be slayed with, with a, a a number of different tools. So I just confront it. Yeah. I, I always, I think kind of two things you're trying to hold in tension here. One is respect for the adversary and the other one's humility. Right. And I think where a lot of people sort of show their hand is they don't have a proper respect for their opponent. Okay. So they might, you know, some person might say an off the cuff remark, but at the at the center of this is that sort is Satan is the demonic is the demonic influence and and Satan's particular intelligence, which is the highest intelligence, highest natural intelligence that there is. Yeah. And so if you go into that thinking, you know, oh, whatever, you know, like, I don't know, you kind of show your cards, you show your weakness. If you can't if you can't in, engage those things with a sense of sort of seriousness and gravity, I'll, I'll relate it to football. All right. There are some really good football players. And when you've played at a high level, you recognize that I can't just amp myself up into a place where I'm just going to beat whoever I want. I have to be on my game. I have to be sharp. I have to be aggressive. I have to be tactful. I've got to blend a lot of things to be successful. And so I think that's one pole you have to hold sort of intention is a sort of respect for what you have to do. You have to prove it. You have to demonstrate your knowledge over and over and over again. And then on the other end is the humility. And to me, the, the best image I've ever gotten of humility is St. Anselm's levels of humility. And so when you move up those levels, you go from acknowledging your wrongs, right? Feeling bad for them, uh, confessing them, being forthright about them, enduring ridicule, seeing ridicule as a gift, and then loving those who ridicule you. I mean, if you get to those higher stages, now you're ready to sort of harness that respect and that demonstration of what you've done. You know, humility isn't like, like deferring to someone. Like, oh, okay. never mind. Whatever. Right. Humility is actually being willing to put yourself on the line over and over again and sort of prove it or not, or be exposed for not being able to in that moment. So I know, you know, when, when I talk to Royce and whatnot, and most of the slings and arrows that I got are, are 10 years ago, right. Over stuff with my own football career and, and things that went down. But when I talk to Royce, that's, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I kind of bring to bear is like, here, as you perfect that humility, 
then you harness that respect. And, and at the, the same time, you sort of, you harness and demonstrate your intellect. That's why I respect someone like yourself, Tim, because you'll put it on the line. You'll actually try and demonstrate over and over again, what you know, and regardless of whether someone wants to dismiss you or whatnot, who cares? Yeah. So, so to but, me, that's but, what, but yeah. what one and one, there's two sort of planes happening at once. There's a spiritual and then there's the physical. And right. yes, the, the physical always should see to the spiritual. And in the end, it will, you know, inevitably that that's, that's un, uh, you know, that's undeniable. Yeah. But, but the question I think that Christians have to wrestle with is what is the proper mode of ministry? And then when is it time to fight? Right. Yeah. I mean, that is a very serious and, and deeply profound question that Christians have to answer right now, today, everywhere around the world. What 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 does it mean? What does ministry look like in a satanic world? What does ministry look like in a world run by demons and what measures will we have to go to? It's like the book of Eli. Right. I mean, I love the movie, the book of Eli. I hate to use a Hollywood satanic uh, institution reference like, you know, but but in order to in order to carry that that scripture that he had memorized in his head, you know, the last Bible in a post-apocalyptic world. And he had to fight people who were eating each other. He had to kill them. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And, and, you know, he didn't insult them while he was, while he was, you know, hacking them down, but, and he didn't go out and try and kill anybody he didn't have to. And he saved people along the way. Um, but, but I just look at it as um, we, we do have to answer that question. And sometimes for me, it just feels like the people that I'm faced to faced are not lacking of knowledge. And there's a distinction that has to be made in people that are ignorant to it or in on it. Right. And, and I, I don't see a lot like the, the people who come with these flippant sort of ready made responses that are intended to be subversive and just sort of, uh, uh, you know, humiliating or, yeah, yeah. or or intentionally frustrating or what they've come to be known as trolls. Right. Um, the trolling thing, the, the, this is a, this is a modern age technocratic form of, of demonic, right? And so, so you, you, you're supposed to rebuke and refute. Yeah. Now the question is, what does rebuke and refute look like in today's world versus, you know, the, the, the scripture world. But, um, that, that's kind of where I, I still struggle to this day. Cause it's like, man, you know, we're out here fighting. And, and then you could just concede to it. And this is a, this is a problem I have with many Christians. And I hear it all the time in the political conservative movement. Uh, Jesus is going to take care of it. Yeah. You know, that'll happen. So, you know, you don't need to worry. Just pray. It's like, oh, really? OK. I mean, you you have a profound sense of prayer. And if you do, amen to yeah. you. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I love that. I, I would hope for that. That's the best case scenario. But I would venture to guess that what from what I see and from the trajectory we've built, from a democratic, a post-liberal democratic, uh, post-World War II democratic liberal order, most people's prayer life is not what they would want to claim it to be online or on, on podcasts. And I'm not talking about us here, but I'm just saying in general that we are much more flawed than we give credit to and in a much more flawed state where our prayer life isn't as strong as we would need it to be. The outside world becomes immediate and its ability to influence us and pull us further towards the fleshly. Royce, you and I are the same, almost self-same in our struggles. I've become slightly more restrained, but I'm still always tempted to cite St. Augustine. Hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. And I'm always like my natural spirit to, to, to fight, to defend myself against some of these petty fellow Catholics against the you know the outside world as well is always being pseudo justified by this saint augustine quote i have ring in my head and my the people that i keep close are like you know your natural impulses yes anger and courage are good but they have to be mediated so i it's you know what you see now is me trying to work that out not just pray pray the satanism away because we do have to fight and I think you're right. Ministry in the war, in a satanic world needs to be a philosophical topic. Maybe, you know, maybe even for another day where it gets specific treatment, but it, we have to mediate it somehow. And um, I don't like what Ambrose said because it's true and it's hard, but when Mike, Mike uh, 
And then Elliot and, and Will, what do you guys say on this topic? It's it's really a an important question to me. I've been struggling with some of this stuff lately. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. And, uh, you know, the technological forums that we have now certainly don't facilitate cool cool rational discussion face to face you know we you know where where nuance is respected and and you know men can can sort of look one another in the eye and figure out like what you know what what is this or not you know um so i'd say just the just keep in mind that the technological medium is the algorithms are meant to to wind us up and to to keep us on the platform more and more and to uh to not be able to communicate clearly and, and to, to have to do it in these, these little, you know, 140 character pockets. Um, so I wondered to what degree a lot of this would just, it would just be solved if, if there were just a, a better medium, uh, you know, so I would just be, you know, caution everybody, including myself, not to, to keep that in mind and, and to remember that the, uh, you know, the, the medium is, restricting and sculpting a lot of the message uh on both sides and that that can skew our sense of of what it, what the what the reasonable versus rash response is that's good i like that a lot a- a- elliot you've got a big giant channel and you get a lot of love and and a lot of hate and it's kind of kind of like me uh, one way it's distinguished from royce uh who's on the you know big national television is when you i mean you have a much bigger channel than i do here but people on youtube particularly with a big prominent youtuber like you pretend they know you and that that's difficult for a man to to be approached it's in like every rap song like you know you don't know me you think you know me it's very very riling to have someone that's never met you that you might have invited on your show pretend to know you and call you all mm-hmm. sorts of nastiness. Like how, how have you, and you've been in the game a long time, YouTube game here. I think the longest out of any of us. So how, how do you deal with that, man? Man. Uh, so the right word is idolize, right? Like to make you something that you're not to create something in my mind about what you are and what you should be uh, is false. And so I know that any conception that someone has of me is false. And it goes both ways. I'm happy that you asked about, you know, loving comments or appreciative comments versus negative ones. They're just as insidious and can uh, lead you down a, a rabbit hole uh, that's unresourceful and disordered, right? So the, the pleasure that is received from getting someone's approval in a comment is just as uh, disordered and unresourceful as getting upset, right? And I caught myself, you know, I started making YouTube videos in 2007. And uh, there, I've been, you know, up and down and, and left and right. I caught myself being addicted to positive comments. There was a time when I was like a golden boy in fitness YouTube and nobody ever said anything negative to me. And that was when they had thumbs up and thumbs down. Now they don't have thumbs down. I would have videos with, you know, tens of thousands of views, not a single thumbs down. And people would even comment about that. They'd be like, wow, at least the only guy I've ever seen that doesn't have, and so pride, you know, I started thinking, well, <laughs> cause I can't do any wrong. Of course I helped you out. Of course I saved your life. Of course your life is better because of me, right? Yeah. And that to me was much more damaging because it snuck in. Like the negative comments, they hit me in the face. I'm like, boom, okay, I know that hurt right there. But the, but the positive ones, they sneak in and they just whisper in. And those are the ones that you mm. know, I started to watch out for more than any. And then as I started to realize my pride grow and I distanced myself from the positive ones, realizing, okay, I'm addicted to these positive uh, aff- affirming comments, comments. The negative ones started hurting more. And so it became such an imbalance where I would ignore all the good ones. <laughs> yeah. But then get all fired up about the bad ones. Yeah. And so to me at this point, what I've discovered is complete detachment from what anybody says. I never, I don't have any feelings about anything that anybody says. I read what people say and I say, huh? If it's good, I say, huh? If it's bad, I say, huh? And you'll be hard pressed unless I'm just in, I got a hair up my ass and I just feel like 
fight with people, which sometimes happens, but and, you know, that's just because I'm entertaining myself. Very rarely will you see me uh, defend myself or respond to somebody in a negative or positive way. I let people be and I let their comments be. And I know that for the most part, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah, I don't even read YouTube. I stopped reading YouTube comments uh, the end of my days on Taylor Marshall's channel. It was just like, it's it's too much. Steph, Steph will dispose of the important comments on YouTube. I'll, I'll see him very occasionally. And it's like, I, I, I don't even need this because it's so insidious. My friend Patrick Coffin told me, watch out for the really negative ones. They sting. Watch out even more for the really positive ones because they don't sting. It's exactly what you you just described. You know, I mean, there's a reason Caesar paid a man to follow him around the streets of old Rome, the ghetto, just whispering into his ear, "You're merely a man." So it's the 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 positive mm -hmm. ones are are perhaps more dangerous, like you're saying, Elliot. But you know, I'm not even talking necessarily just YouTube comments. I'm talking being called out on other shows in outright dishonest ways it's it's hard and and i ultimately i know the truth is what aj said and um uh you know you just forbearance this is this is the the illuminative path or path to the illuminative path anyway uh will what do you think about this a lot of it is meekness isn't it not letting small things make you unreasonably angry and you have to learn to ignore it i've heard it described as eagles not pecking with pigeons as well so do you really want to devote all that time to that small thing is it that important to you and best to just ignore it and i think there's a connection to ruling a household as a father as well with meekness because you don't want to let little things make you fly off the handle so i think bringing it back to that practical management of kids who are often disobedient and unruly that's part of the discipline of being a man and there's a line that some of the stuff you guys were talking about earlier reminded me of. This is 1 Timothy 3, 5. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So wow. it's that kind of even keel, which meekness is really all about. That I think men learn in the family first, and you apply that to your day-to-day -day interactions as well. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It will like everything you, you say is gold, man. I, I had people telling me last weekend, like, man, everything will says is gold. I'm really, I can say really excited. We're, we're trying to hammer out the details. It'd be dope. I also, by the way, I don't think I've ever said this publicly. I have, I have a very prominent fear of flying like you, Royce. That's why my family owns an RV. So, but I, I would love to be able to get this group of guys together in, in, in a real place, Dasein actually being there and be able to to go a little faster, have less than one and a half seconds transaction time in between comments because no one wants to interrupt each other. But I I'm I'm thrilled to be doing these uh C mask videos with with Will, Elliot, Mike, you guys you guys each add something that uh, in my view is um indispensable and and having AJ and Royce has been a lot of fun here today. So thank you. I, I didn't even realize we'd gone two hours, but this this was a lot of fun today. If ever I'll give everyone a parting shot and then we we should um close up shop. Thank you all though. Yeah, you wanna uh and maybe AJ and, and Royce, you wanna uh hit, hit us with a closing parting shot? Yeah, yeah, I'll start. Uh you know what what Will said there calls to mind that that order of charity. You can look that up on Aquinas. Aquinas is Summa under charity. I think it may be 26 of them. There's the order and there's a sort of structure and it's, it's who's closest to you. And so I'm thinking, you know, the, the petty comments, if it's someone close to you, you got to attend to them. If it's someone more remote, now you're inverting the order of charity. And so there's actually an error going on there. And so I, that comes to mind for me, but even that aside, uh, just want to thank you, you know, for, for having us and, and for all you guys, um, it's it's an honor to be in, in, in all of your company. Um, I respect you guys a lot. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the discussion. Thank yeah, you. Um, I definitely would say that uh, we, we have a, a crisis of faith and, and we have to continue to try and uh, bolster our faith and, and the fruit that comes with it. Um, and, and I'm certainly thankful for you, Tim, and, and all the work that you do 
um, and, and, and all the other gentlemen that are here today. I'm thankful to be here and be able to be a part of this discussion. I'm glad to be here with my brother, AJ and, and, and get him, uh, to be heard, you know, in, in the public sphere, he's done a lot of, uh, I know that he's done a lot of work on, on himself in, in that solitude to be able to, to be able to add the things, the conversation that he can. So it excites me to be here in, in, in that more personal sense as well. Um, and you know, I look forward to the, the future conversations that we can have as well. Godspeed. I've always felt like I've known AJ really well because of how strongly he resembles in both spirit and actually kind of looks uh one of my very best friends who's one of my ex-students who also is a uh white wide receiver of all things so it, it, there we it, go all right yeah it's funny no i he's he's can't very you guys can't avoid very the simple. comparisons they asked yeah. me back in college they asked me uh so who do you try and model, model your game after it was an interview with like you know one of the local little papers and i said terrell owens and I just stared at the guy because he was like, you know, he was expecting me to say, you know, I don't know, Ed McCaffrey or something, you know, someone, you know, and I go, I go Terrell Owens. Edelman. And he like, wanted Edelman. I was like, yeah. yeah, I was like, I don't know. You know, that's, I, that's who I try and model my game. But no, it's, it's inevitable that, uh, you know, we get, we get typecast. So Calvin Johnson, Calvin Johnson. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Randy Moss. Yeah. That's what I go after. All right. Oh um, yeah. Anyway, no, that, that, that's, I, I sincerely mean that I've never, never, that someone that reminds me so much of my pal uh uh will and then elliot then mike parting shots also call out anything you guys have coming up books you're releasing or projects or anything i i, I meant to say that to aj with your book wait, wait what's yeah. your book called oh, can you not yeah, my my the book i just finished it's available on amazon is advanced christianity um it's a little i call it scholastic demonstration so it, it's meant to have that rigor but there's just no waste it's just point after point after point i just i try and prove it here's what i know Here's how I associate these things. And uh, that's what you get. And you can sort of jump between chapters. It models the Summa roughly. Start with the one God, then the Blessed Trinity, then who is Christ, the hypostatic union, and then one on predestination, which, by the way, people just butcher left and right, um, and then justice, sin, and despair. So anyways, uh, uh, I'd love, you know, love to get a readership for it, um, but that's in God's hands, so. Well, I want to have you on the show uh, about it one-on-one, -on -one, AJ. Yeah, and yeah, hopefully you absolutely. and Royce can, can join us again here. But I want to have you on the show one-on-one -on -one about your book. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, how about Elliot, then Will, then Mike, and we'll get out of here. Just want to share some gratitude for being in the room with such smart dudes. Uh, I pride myself on being the dumbest one here because you guys make this conversation just out of the stratosphere for me. So listen, uh, I'm grateful. Thank you. And I look forward to continuing. Ellie, we're grateful for you. Me and Mike were literally talking about a couple of your remarks uh, all throughout the last week. Like, man, that was that was like my favorite moment of the shows we've done so far. Uh, uh, so to, no, we're, we're grateful to have you too, bud. Will. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, guys. Royce, AJ, great to meet you today. And well. the emphasis we've had about the speculative intellect, that's really man's desire for order and to understand. And you guys have made it clear in all your comments today that we're in a war. And here's a great line to finish on to reflect. A wise man is strong and a knowing man, stout and valiant, because war is managed by due ordering. And there shall be safety where there are many councils. That's from the book of Proverbs safety where there are many councils and it's been a real pleasure to listen to counsel from all of you today and looking mm. forward to doing it again in the future and to men watching form your own groups like this so you can do that because we're in a war we need that order we need counsel and there's strength in numbers like this Thanks, Will. That's that's amazing. You always have the most apropos, perfect quotes for. <laughs> I lucked in. Know? I lucked into having uh, knowing exactly where that democracy quote was in Book Eight of the Republic, so I could thumb through my my complete Plato works. But Will, you all every show, everyone says to me, "How does Will have the perfect quote for the moment?" So, uh, <laughs> and half the time you're not quoting anyone. It's it's Will Nolan. Nolan knows. Uh, it, it's. Yeah, excellent. Mike, Mike, uh, what do you say? 
Uh, yeah, just to, to echo uh, all your gentlemen's uh, same point. Uh, thank you, Tim, for organizing this. Uh, it's great talking with all you guys uh, about these issues. Uh, I'm amazed that we, we burnt through two hours so quickly, you know. Uh, it seems really organic. And uh, not just the content, but Will's point is that in these these times of trials, it seems like men men organize, men form councils they form uh small small groups of, of men in leadership to begin sorting through things and and leading and uh, I, I think that's what we're we're witnessing here uh today uh and i'm just happy to be a part of it and, and very very thankful uh so th thank you all for uh having me yeah great great it's it's i think that there's a lot of energy here and it's like everyone's surprised it's just because book of proverbs this is this is the nature of man natures don't change by the way so this is this is what men are supposed to do and we are trying to encourage uh dudes across the country this is what kills me across the country at these cucked catholic parishes you get the boomers after not just the donuts and coffee but they'll be like let's get a men's group we need to talk about stuff and then you go and it's the same hackneyed low testosterone discussion jokes about the ball and chain jokes about how they're henpecked and ruled by their wives very disrespectful to the wives but they're they're pissing all over the manhood i, I you know men's basketball league i went and scored like 130 points in a parish men's basketball league and i was like i'm not doing that again you know the, the bar's just a, a few notches too low so it's there need to be groups like this where there are actual dudes oh, saying kidding. actual things you know, every single guy here today said something, or probably two two comments at least a piece where I'm like, that's way against the grain and that's way right. And I'm going to be thinking about that for the whole next week. I mean, literally all five of you. Um, so and, and me and Mike will talk once or twice throughout the week and sometimes sort of clean up and be like, wow, that was that was really good. I wish we'd spent more time on that. We were supposed to get to this issue today. One of Mike's prompts, which are always solid gold which is like, what about the protective instinct in men for, for women? They've abandoned, women have abandoned men. Men are abandoning women, you know, in terms of the singles society. Isn't this part of the order of justice that men are like, okay, you're going to screech in my face. I'm not going to stand in the way of the huge tranny that's coming after you like uh, turf a feminist person. So I want to talk about that at a, a, a show coming up soon. I think that's a, a very important question in the warfare and on the field of battle. That's our reality here in late 2022 AD year of our Lord. I, I want to have you two on again. This is really good. And uh, we'll, we'll cut it there.